Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Today's show is dedicated to investors that wish to discern the art of speculation, the virtues of liberty, and what prudent actions you, the investor, need to take. Joining us today is a legendary investor, and I don't say that lightly. Our guest today literally is a market mover. He is a highly regarded philosopher whose presentations can be found on Giant Bandari's highly acclaimed Capitalism and Morality, and he is a renowned author here to discuss his latest timeless masterpiece entitled Speculator High Ground, Mr. Doug Casey. Thank you for joining us, sir. Well, thanks, Morris. I appreciate that. Doug, I know that you are a very, very methodical, so I have to ask, why is the timing of your book, Speculator High Ground, so critical for investors? Well, uh, at the beginning of 2016, we were at the bottom of what was one of the longest and deepest bear markets in mining stocks ever. And um, I don't see mining stocks as being investments. Uh, it's why Warren Buffett never puts any money in resource stocks. You can't predict the price of the commodity that you're mining. Uh, you can't really determine how much you have. You can't determine the political situation. Um, there are so many things that make mining uh, a bad business, quite frankly. Uh, you can only speculate in mining stocks. So um, this book, Speculator, which is my first novel and the first of a series of seven books, reforming the unjustly besmirched occupations of in seven different areas, uh, speculating is one of them. Uh, I explain the mining business and um, how it works and so forth. So it's really a little bit of an education in mining in addition to being a, uh, a novel in the tradition of, uh, well, people like Jack Reacher at this point. Uh, uh, you know, it's adventure, it's about a bush war in Africa and so forth. But now's a good time, uh, I thought, to come out with this novel because we're at the bottom of a bear market. Well, we're not at the bottom anymore, but we're still pretty close. And I think we could have a, a huge bull market where you could make a lot of money in these uh, little mining stocks. Well, before we begin today's discussion, Doug, will you provide listeners with a brief narrative of the difference between a speculator and a gambler? Well, people often confuse, they often conflate those two terms. Uh, a speculator, well, first of all, let me, let, let me start out with saying what an investor is, uh, which is perhaps more basic. Uh, an investor is somebody who allocates money in order to make that money grow uh, in much the way that you plant a, a seed of corn in order to get a, an ear of corn and 100 grains from that one seed. So an investor is somebody that um, is looking to allocate capital to create more capital. That's different from a speculator. A speculator is allocating capital to take advantage of politically caused distortions in the market or to take advantage of uh, bubbles and uh, market crashes and things like that. Uh, we're not interested in building a business, we're interested in increasing our capital. Now, that's different again and often confused with a gambler. And a gambler is just somebody who's, uh, who's looking for action, who um, the odds are always against them because there's a house, there are too many unknowns. Uh, so a gambler is just amusing himself. And uh, it's very different from being either a speculator or an investor. Well, thank you for clarifying that. You know, Doug, as I'm reading, I actually feel as if I'm being mentored by you and I'm with you in the trenches. In your book, you cover a perfect blend of essential items that a speculator needs to consider. For the investor listening, let's delve into some of the uh, virtues and vices you conveyed in Speculator High Ground. Doug, can you cover what are known as the nine Ps I would like to begin with one of them, and that is the first one, and that is people. 
What really grabbed my attention when I began reading was the emphasis you placed on nonverbals. Can you expand why looking at numbers doesn't always convey the whole story? Uh, yeah, that's correct. It doesn't, especially especially with volatile stocks. where Because uh, the type of stocks that I've always been involved in uh, aren't generally this type of stocks where looking at the balance sheet and the income statement tells you everything that you need to know. Um, people are the most important thing. And good people uh, can turn nothing into a huge company. And bad people can take a huge company and blow it up and you wind up with nothing. So the critical thing is to assess the character of the people that you're dealing with uh, and their competence and their experience uh, and so many other things. And the um, people involved in something are more important than the things represented by the other eight P's. I call them the nine P's. It's a mnemonic. Um, there's so many of them, nine, but I'm not sure I can remember them all off the top of my own head at this point. But uh, you look at a list and <clears throat> you kind of check off the boxes to see if you're forgetting something. But um, no, the people are by far the most important thing. And people and investors or speculators, uh, forget gamblers don't even think about it. Uh, but investors and speculators often forget about the people. Uh, they're looking at other things, uh, and uh, they shouldn't. You know, Doug, this is in essence the perfect segue into my next question. As I've learned from attending conferences that exhibitors bring models along as bait. But unless you attend the conferences, you would never know, which is a huge red flag. Can you expand on how a reader can be enlightened on perception and deception from your book? Well, yeah, it's really easy to look at the uh, surface superficialities of these things. And, uh, of course, when you go to a, a mining conference, a lot of the companies actually do hire professional booth bait to attract people over to their booth. Um, well, nothing wrong with that, I suppose. You've got to get people's attention. But... Uh, it can be a distraction. It's, it's, it's true. Um, I like to go to these mining shows because it's one-stop shopping. Uh, you can meet the managements of, well, if you've got two eight-hour days uh, wandering around the booths that these mining companies put up, you've got two eight-hour days to meet a lot of people. You might be able to, you know, have a, an intelligent conversation with 20 or 30 different managements um, and they're all in one place you save your time you save your money uh, of course I've spent a lot of time also going on mining trips with these companies uh, to their properties you get to know I, I don't do that unless I think it's seriously interesting because it takes a lot of time but um, if you think it's worthwhile, if they pass the original smell test, uh, then you get to know them better and uh, you can investigate all the other things that you need to do um, if you're going to put serious money into a mining property. Well, Mr. Casey, you make a very clear distinction between the virtues of liberty and the vices of government. Why do you feel it is imperative to draw this analysis in a book based on speculation? Well, uh, I'm, I'm an anarchist. Um, most people have the wrong impression of anarchists. They think of them as violent people with dressed in black capes with little round black bombs with a fused lip. This is ridiculous. Um, anarchism is probably the gentlest of all philosophies because we don't believe in coercion. We don't believe in force. Uh, we believe in market forces as opposed to government forces. In other words, we believe in voluntarism as opposed to coercion. Um, so, uh, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, the whole world looks to government for wisdom, for laws, for t 
keep society together. And this is entirely incorrect. Uh, government, as an entity, is a dead hand on society. It's a, a parasite living off people that produce. Government doesn't create anything. All it does is tax and regulate, have wars, pogroms, persecutions, confiscations. Uh, they control the currencies of countries. They destroy these currencies regularly. Um, the institution of government itself is flawed. And I think that um, in an advanced industrial society, the institution of government itself is unnecessary, as shocking as that is uh, for most people to hear. So I explore that theme uh, in, in the book Speculator as well, because it takes place in a um, small backward African country. And uh, we look at the governments of African countries in the book. And uh, you can compare them to the governments of big countries like the U.S. So, uh, yeah, I know that's an important thing to consider. Most people think of government as just being part of the cosmic firmament, as a given. It's always been there, always will be. Uh, I prefer not to see it that way. Well, thank you for conveying that. You know, sticking with this theme, if I may. I want to cover my favorite chapter, which interestingly did not cover the, uh, the, the main character. Chapter 28, you share a dialogue between two people that have conflicting ideologies regarding liberty and government. As you identify how the world of academia and media through their progressive and liberal agendas influence people through sophisms, which are very pernicious. Please expand on this narrative. Well, what I decided to do, you know, th this book has some similarities with uh, Ayn Rand's books because uh, I'm not an objectivist, which is what Ayn Rand called her philosophy. Uh, it's a stage I passed through. I think that she didn't go nearly far enough, frankly, uh, in her own philosophy. And she was a little bit dogmatic, and her followers tend to be so cult-like uh, that it's almost like a secular religion. Uh, that said, I'm a big fan, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of, of Ayn Rand. So, but I wanted to explain a lot of these philosophical issues, but I didn't want to do it quite the way Rand did. Uh, you might recall in Atlas Shrugged, uh, which everybody should read that book, but there's a, about a hundred page long uh, speech by the hero, John Galt, where she explains her philosophy. Uh, it gets a little bit heavy going sometimes. Excellent stuff, but a little bit heavy going. So I took one chapter where um, uh, one of our heroes, uh, uh, Springer, uh, is questioning uh, one of our anti-heroes, uh, Sabina, uh, about um, about a number of things, and uh, I think people will find it interesting. I got the idea for that from a book written by a good friend of mine, Walter Block. He wrote a book called Defending the Undefendable, and uh, in it, Walter takes occupations that most people think are horrible occupations, like a used car salesman, uh, a, a gun dealer, uh, a, a prostitute, all these things, and Walter shows that as long as these people uh, act in a <clears throat> non-coercive manner, these are perfectly honorable occupations to engage in. So <clears throat> that one chapter kind of summarizes what Walter did in his book. I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you uh, liked it, Morris. I really enjoyed it. I actually saw similarities between uh, Henry Hazlitt's economics in one lesson in uh, in that chapter. So. Uh, it's a great, great chapter, as as well as every chapter in the book. Uh, switching, uh, <laughs> I'll go and ahead. I, and I, so I'd also recommend uh, Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, uh, because it actually is <coughs> economics in one lesson. It's a superb book. I recommend it very highly. Yes, sir. Switching gears, Doug, investors want to hear your speculation on how the natural resource space will perform under President-elect Trump. What uh, sectors are garnering your attention right now in the natural resource base? 
Well, it's impossible to tell what Trump will really do. Uh, it's impossible to tell what the Congress and the Supreme Court will let him do. But I can say this, it's that the president of the U.S. is much more powerful now <clears throat> than he's ever been in the past. I mean, power is it's like centering on the executive side of government. So he can do a lot. So what can we expect? One example is um, the, the largest undeveloped <clears throat> gold copper deposit in the world, which is in uh, southern Alaska, uh, the pebble deposit <clears throat> owned by Northern Dynasty. And uh, uh, I've been very involved in Northern Dynasty for the last year. <clears throat> I believe that Trump was going to win. I actually placed some bets with other people in the business as well as a bookie in Australia uh, getting good odds that Trump would win, and I was right. Uh, but I expect to win much more <clears throat> with Trump in office because the EPA uh, has just been a bear stopping the development of mining projects all over the U.S. I mean, the EPA is run by and populated by uh, left-wing ideologues <clears throat> that think their job is to stop anything from happening. Uh, Trump's going to change that. And I think that Northern Dynasty, well, Northern Dynasty has already quintupled from its recent bottom. And I think a lot of that's because of Trump, uh, because their big problem was not technical or economic. Their big problem was political. And I think there's going to be a number of other things like that where um, uh, Trump is going to at least rein in, and I hope abolish the EPA. I hope he abolishes a whole bunch of agencies, but uh, that's what I'd like. I, I don't expect that. But I think he'll set a tenor uh, that'll be good. Hence, you mentioned the relationship with government in the art of speculation for that very reason. <laughs> you know, uh, yes. I mean, if, if we lived in a free market society, uh, speculators would be very largely unemployed because there would be very, very few distortions to, for speculators to capitalize on. If central banks didn't exist, there wouldn't be chronic inflation, which leads to busts and uh, credit collapses. Uh, so speculators would be very, very few if we lived in a free market society. We'd have to be investors, which would be much better for society as a whole. But that's not the world we live in. You know, speaking of central banks, you know, for an investor that has not deployed capital to precious metals, uh, what words of wisdom would you like to share with them? Uh, about central banks? Well, owning precious metals. The relationship uh, of currency debasement and owning gold and silver? Ah, well, you know, at this point, I've got to say that uh, gold is no longer $35 an ounce. Uh, when I first started investing, it was. Um, and, but, you know, even as recently as 2001, which is not ancient history, this is recent history now, 2001. Um, Gold was like $260 an ounce, and people forget that in 2001, at $260 an ounce, gold was cheaper in real terms than it was in 1971 at $35 an ounce because the debasement of the currency has been so great over those um, intervening 40 years, um, 30 years. Um, so there are times to buy gold gold is a speculation and there are times to sell gold is a speculation but what I do consistently and I've done for a long long time is I continue accumulating physical gold in the form of coins generally speaking and I put them aside and I forget about them and I consider that savings in its most basic form uh, better than saving dollars in a bank absolutely in fact, putting dollars in the bank is very foolish at this point, at this point for a lot of different reasons. So uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but uh, 
Sometimes gold is an excellent speculation, but it's always a good savings vehicle. You know, Doug, we also have investors that uh, love stewardship in silver and platinum and palladium. Do you feel the same way about those metals as gold or do you view them differently? Well, right now, as we speak at the end of 2016, uh, all the commodities are very, very cheap. I mean, that five-year bear market that started in 2011, uh, it wasn't just true of gold and silver. They went down a lot. But all the commodities, uh, you know, wheat and the tropicals and the cattle and everything, everything went down together, the commodities. So um, if I could save, you know, sugar or corn or wheat, but you can't. I mean, where are you going to put 10 tons of sugar? Where are you going to put a carload of wheat? That's the advantage of gold and silver is that they're, they're um, compact and you can have a lot of value in a small area. But uh, to answer the question about palladium and platinum and copper, they're industrial metals. And um, since I believe that due to the business cycle, we're going to have a very nasty depression. Uh, well, the depression actually started in many ways uh, in the early 1970s from the point of view of the standard of living of the average American. It's much, much lower than it would have been otherwise. But <clears throat> I think that uh, the financial system could really collapse uh, in the near term. And if that happens, purely industrial metals like, uh, like platinum and palladium and copper, for instance, uh, they're not going to do well. Uh, so, um, in fact, the longest trend in all of financial history is commodities going down. They've been going down in real terms for 10,000 years. That's true, incidentally. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, they're interesting from time to time, but I'm not too interested in them right now. And, to answer your question. And does that hold the same for silver, just to clarify? Uh, yeah, silver is kind of <clears throat> half an industrial metal, half a monetary metal. And I do like silver because, um, because it's a much smaller market than gold. Uh, it's, um, and there are no great above ground stores of silver either. And it's kind of a poor man's gold. It's really much more volatile. So if I like gold, uh, because I think there's going to be a panic into gold during the next monetary crisis, um, silver's got much more speculative appeal than gold does. So I'm very friendly towards silver. Well, I know listeners are uh, grateful for your uh, wisdom here. Last question. What did I forget to ask? Hmm. Well, um, you can get a copy of Speculator, which I hope all your listeners do, just by going on Amazon. And I think they're going to be very pleased with, uh, with reading it. Uh, but I guess you already asked that. So I was just giving myself a final plug. Oh, no, that was, my, that was going to be my, uh, my last uh, question to you. Where can we purchase Speculator High Ground? And you stated it is on Amazon. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, it's a pity that bookstores really don't exist anymore. They're, they're so few and far between. <clears throat> Amazon has really disrupted the entire book trade. So if you want to buy a book today for practical reasons, because there's a million new books. Well, actually, that's incorrect. There's about 1.5 million new books published every year. And no bookstore can stock them all. So, um, yeah, Amazon is the place to, uh, to get it. But Barnes & Noble and so forth, I guess. But it's all done either on Kindles or things of that nature or um, by uh, shipping from the central warehouse these days, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, the next release, when should we expect that? Ah, the next book is going is Drug Lord, and uh, we're about eighty percent, ninety percent done with it at this point. And uh, Charles Knight, um, having had well, I don't want to re reveal what happens in uh, Speculator, but let's say <clears throat> for reasons of his own, he decides to get into the drug business, and so Drug Lord is going to be released in July of this year, and. Uh, 
we explain how our hero, Charles, who's a likable, very ethical guy, gets into the drug business, both the legal drug business, like Big Pharma, and the illegal drug business, as in things like cocaine and LSD and so forth. And we explain how that business works, uh, how these various drugs work, uh, the morality of being a drug lord, and so forth. And um, so that's the next book. And again, investors, do take note, that will be released in July. Legendary investor and author, Doug Casey, thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thanks. I do appreciate the opportunity, Morris. I hope that our connection, because I'm in Buenos Aires at the moment, hasn't been too rough. <laughs> well, I think investors will just enjoy hearing the audio version at a minimum. Thank you again, sir. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.